How many of you would agree with me that um, maybe you are a little on, on the edge right now? Maybe you're a little grieved or find yourself fighting back with some anxiousness or some concern. When you look around in today's world and you realize how divided we are. It's a lot of division. Like, there's more division in, in our world today than I've ever seen in my lifetime. Everywhere you, wor- you look, there's division. Just in, in the, just the recent weeks, think about it. In the recent weeks, as, as the courts have overturned some decisions that have been made long ago, we've seen division. There's division. Either you're either pro-life or you're pro-choice. There's, there's division there. There's division when it comes to guns. You know, should people have the right to carry guns? To arm themselves? Is it guns that kill people or is it people that kill people? I mean, there's, 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 there's division everywhere. There's, there's no unity. We don't see it. There's division when it comes to education, when it comes to our borders. There's division when it comes to justice. Everywhere you look, you turn on the news, and you're going to see some kind of story where there's there's division. We're, we're We're not unified. We're not unified in how we raise our kids. We're not unified in in morality. We're, I'll tell you, and this one disturbs me because we've talked about this one a lot. We're not even unified in, in how we, uh, how, how, what we do with toilet paper in our houses. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Is it over or is it under? I mean, we're, I got to illustrate this for you because some of you are not getting it. I go to houses all the time, and if you want to know, one of the things that I do is I check your bathroom out. I just want to see if you're saved or not. And, and it, I can tell based on how you have your toilet paper. Now, if I walk into your, your restroom or your bathroom at your house, and this is what I see, this is not good. Like, nobody wants to go for toilet paper like this right here. Do do you understand? It it should look like this. Some of you are repenting right now, right? Some of you are thinking about that guest bathroom at home right now. And this is what it looks like. But you're going to go home. Nobody, nobody wants to do this. Nobody wants to do that. No, no, it's, 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 it's over. How, how many over people do we have in the house? Go ahead, raise your hands. Yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, under, any unders? Okay, some of you need to get saved. So at the very end of the service, we're going to have an altar call. You, those of you that are watching online, is it over or under? Come on, come on, help us out in the chats. Over or under, I'm going to tell you, it's over. It's always over, even with toilet paper. Even with toilet paper, there's division. And we laugh about it, right? I mean, we laugh. That, that's funny. That's, that's really funny. But you, you want to know someone else that's laughing? Satan. Now, he's not laughing about the toilet paper, but he is laughing at us. His strategy is to divide us. His strategy is to come into the, 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 the body of Christ and to create division. He wants to get us focused over here because if he can get us focused over here on something that really doesn't matter, then he can come in from over there and attack us. That's his game plan. If... Um, one of the things that I, I, I really enjoy is when we go to Ke- Kenya, one of the, the places that we visit is the, what is called the village market. 
So if you ever go to Kenya with us, in fact, in, in 2023, we're going we're gonna to go back over. We're going to take a group to Kenya, and um, we're, we will take you to what is called the village market. Now, I like the village market because it's where all the locals come together to sell their goods, okay? Their handmade goods. They come together, and it is a wild and crazy place. You can talk to any of the people that have gone. It's crazy. Now, what's fun is to take the newbies, all right? Because here's their, this, this is their goal. Their goal when you get there is to divide and conquer. That's what they want to do. They, they see us. When we walk in, they're like, okay, we're going to get them. We're, we're going to divide them. We're going to pull them apart. And as soon as you walk in, you'll have them coming up to you. My friend, my friend, you come, you come. My friend, my friend, you come with me. You, you buy from me. I mean, that, that's, you, you just start hearing this everywhere. Just buy something small. Buy something small from me. Come on, my friend, my friend. And, and what they want to do is they want to separate you. They want to divide you. So what I do is I will go with the newbies. I will walk around with them and, and, and just kind of watch and, and see what happens. And, and oftentimes they'll get there and they'll start talking and, 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 and the, the people there try to sell them things. Like, my friend, you, you buy this, 10,000, 10,000 shillings. And they'll look at me and I'm like, mm-mm. No, no, no. Ten, and then, then the person, the local will look at me, what? why not 10,000? That's too much. Oh, that's way too much. And, and we'll start negotiating. And, and I have to do that because of people like my daughter. I, I, I've got a daughter. I'm telling you, Caden, she'll go and she'll give everything away. She gets mad at me. We'll leave there. Dad, why did you, you took their money from them. I'm like, honey, I know we didn't take their money. We negotiated. She didn't understand, but we've, we've learned over time that when they divide, they conquer us. The last time we were there, I had this one guy. He walked up to me, and he just, out of his mouth, he's like, like why, do you, why do you teach them to take our money? What, what do you mean? Oh, you're teaching them to take our money. I said, no, I'm not teaching them to take your money, and he just gets right in my face. And I'm like, oh, hold on a minute now. I could feel my inner redneck starting to come out, <laughs> you know. He had a goal. His goal was to divide us so that he could conquer us. And that is the evil one's goal. He wants to divide us. I'm going to read the words of uh, the Apostle Paul. He wrote to a church just like us in Corinth, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, I mean chapter 1, verse 10. This is what he said. He said, I, I, I appeal to you. So he's like, I'm begging you, I'm pleading you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree and that there be no divisions among you, no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind, in the same judgment no divisions like he's pleading with the church he's begging them no divisions please don't be divided don't be split don't you like what, what's happening is you're, you're you've literally have been ripped apart don't allow that to happen and when I look around today that's that's very much what I see in the world I see the church has been divided we've we've been pulled apart We've been split. Jesus saw this. Jesus in John chapter 17, he, he, he knew just before he would finish the work that he came here to do, he, he would tell God, he said, God, I've given them the words that you gave me. I, I've done it. And he knew at that moment that there was a great division coming. He, he even said it. He said, an hour is coming when you will scatter each to his own house and, and will leave me alone. Like there's, there's going to be a great scattering that's going to take place. And hasn't it happened? Jesus, in this same chapter, he prays a prayer. And this is going to be like our primary text for today. I, I want to read it to you. He prays this prayer and beginning in verse 20, this is what his conversation with God is. He says, I'm praying 
not only for these disciples, but also for all who will ever believe in me through their message. Now, I want to take a quick time out, and I want you to understand, right there, Jesus is praying for you, and he's praying for me. He's praying for all who would ever believe because of the disciples' words and because of their testimony. That's us. That's you and I. He says in verse 21, he says, I pray that they will all be one just as you and I are one, as you are in me, Father, and I am in you. And may, and may they be in us so that the world will believe you sent me. I have given them the glory you gave me so that they may be one. Everybody say be one. So that they may be one as we are one. Verse 23 says, I am in them and you are in me. And may they experience such perfect unity. Everybody say perfect unity. May they experience such perfect unity that the world will know that you sent me and that they, that you love them as much as you love me. That was the prayer that Jesus prayed. What's he praying for? He's praying for unity. He's praying for us to be united. But yet when we look across the church, what are we? We're divided. If he can divide us, he can conquer us. Last couple of weeks we've talked about in our lives how sometimes we can just sit back and and it's like we just leave the door open for the enemy to come in and to attack. If he can get us focused over here, then he can sweep in over here and take us down. And that's, what a, that's what's happening. Today what I want to do is I want to ask this question, why aren't we unified? Why? Why? Why is there so much division? I'm going to answer that with two statements. Because my hope is if I can help you understand why we're not unified, if I can help you see why we're divided, then somewhere in there we can come together. In fact, um, today I've entitled the sermon, No More Division. Like that's what's my prayer, like no more. No more. Let's, let's just get rid of division. No more division. Why is it that we're divided? There's two reasons. The first one is this. We're divided because we're fighting the wrong enemy. That's what we're doing. We're fighting the wrong enemy. The, the, we, we all have an enemy that's attacking us, that's dividing us. But I can promise you this. It's not the church. The, the, the enemy is, is not your spouse. I know some of you walked in thinking, well, well, no, hold on now, you don't know mine. I promise you, they're not the enemy. The enemy's not your job. It's not your crazy neighbor. That's, that's not your enemy. Your enemy is not your boss. It's not your ex. The enemy's not the affair. The enemy is not your addiction. It's not your enemy. In fact, in this prayer, Jesus gives us an indication of what our enemy is. If you, if you go up a few verses to verse 15, this is what he says to God. He says, I'm not asking you to take them out of the world. God, I'm not, I'm not asking you to take them out. But just look what he says. But to keep them safe from who? The evil one. To keep them safe from the evil one. You know who the evil one is? When, when you read scripture, that's our spiritual enemy. There's all kinds of names for him in the Bible. He, he's called Lucifer. He's Satan. He's the evil one. He's the prince of darkness. He's the liar, the thief, the deceiver, the destroyer. He's the divider. I mean, this is our enemy. It's interesting, when, when you read the scriptures and you read Jesus, three times in the scriptures, Jesus calls him the prince of this world. 
That Greek word prince is the Greek word archon. A-R-C-H-O-N. Archon. It's a, it's a political term. It's a, it's a word that was used in Jesus' day to identify like the highest ranking Roman officials in that day. So when Jesus uses that word, what he's saying is that this creature, this one that is called the the prince of this world, the, the, the deceiver, the evil one, the thief, all those names, this one is the most powerful, most influential creature on the planet. If you go over and you read in Matthew chapter 4 and and you see where Jesus was taken out by the Holy Spirit to to be tempted by Satan, he's going to spend 40 days in the wilderness, 40 days fasting, okay? And after that 40 days, Satan's going going to attack him. And three times he attacks him. And if you'll notice, in that attack, Satan himself identifies or claims that he has all the kingdoms of the world in his hands. All the kingdoms. He tells Jesus, I'll give you anything that you want. And if you'll notice, Jesus never denies it. I mean, you think about it. This is God in flesh. If it wasn't true, wouldn't it have been easy for Jesus to say, hold on a minute, Satan, you're saying all the kingdoms of this world? You don't have all the kingdoms of this world. This is not your world. This is mine. I'm the one that created it, but he didn't do it. He didn't deny it. He didn't disagree with him. In fact, Jesus would tell us in other places, like John 10.10, he says, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. He's talking about the enemy here. We have this enemy. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it more abundantly. So we, we have this This enemy that that wants to steal our unity. He wants to kill our churches. He literally wants to destroy you. That's why you can read the scriptures and you can see people, disciples, who who faced off on him. Guys like Peter. In 1 Peter chapter 5, these are the words that Peter wrote. He says, be sober-minded. Be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. That's our enemy. The person with a different skin color, it's not your enemy. The person who votes differently than than you vote, They're not your enemy. The person who dresses differently than you dress, they're not your enemy. The person who attacks your views or your beliefs on social media, I know you want to think this is right, but it's not. They're not your enemy. They're just not your enemy. The LGBTQ community, they're not your enemy. You have one enemy. And the reason why we're so divided is we've been fighting the wrong one. Why is it that we're, we're not unified? Why is there so much division? Not only is it because we're fighting the wrong enemy, but number two, it's because we've forgotten the right mission. We've forgotten it. See, every single one of us have a mission. In, in fact, every day you wake up, you're on mission. The moment you get out of bed, you're on mission. For some of you, you're on mission to get that first cup of coffee. Right? T- today, you are on mission. When you got up, you're on mission to find the, the perfect outfit to wear to church. Others of you, you are on mission. Okay, well, you know, what, what shoes am I going to wear? Is it going to be Jordans or gonna be, is it going to be Yeezys? Which one? What, what is it, what's it going to be today? You are on mission. Some of you guys, you are on mission just to get your wives out of the house just so you could be at church on time, right? You're on mission. For others of you, you're on mission just not to you know, kill your kids because they're driving you crazy. I know, we're, we're all 
We all have a mission in life. Our problem is, many times we have picked up the wrong mission when it comes spiritually. In Jesus' prayer, we see our mission. I'm, I'm going to go back to it, okay? I'm going to go back, and uh, we'll go back to verse 21. And this is what Jesus prayed. He says, I pray that they will all be one, just as you and I are one. And this is what he says, so that the world will believe you sent me. Verse 23, he says, the world will know that you sent me and that you love them as much as you loved me. Right there, Jesus is declaring our mission. And the whole mission is so that the world would know him. The world would know, the world would see the gospel, the love of Jesus. Several times in scripture, he's gonna tell this. I'll give you some other examples. Mark 16, verse 15. Jesus said, go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. In Matthew 28, verse 19, Jesus said, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. He's giving us our assignment. He's giving us our mission. Our problem is we've forgotten this. We, we've forgotten that everyone's life would be better with Jesus at the center of their life. We've forgotten that people actually need Jesus. And, and sadly, we, we've made it all about our mission, all about just proving our point. We've made our mission all about just being right. So much so that we'll post things, hurtful things, degrading things on social media. And, and we, we think it's helping. We do it. A lot of people will do it with, with the best of intentions. But the truth of the matter is it just hurts. It doesn't promote unity. It shows division. We've forgotten the right mission. No other thing on the planet was created in the image and the likeness of God. Think about this. No other thing on the planet has the ability to reflect God and his love to the world. Not the mountains, not the oceans, not the galaxies. Like, like nothing has that kind of potential. And for all of us who have been changed by Jesus... We want other people to be changed by him as well. And we've just forgotten that that's our mission. Our mission is that. Jesus said it. In John 13, he said this in verse 34. He says, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for them. This, this one thing, like the Bible gives us this one example, this one thing, one way for the world to know that we follow Jesus. What is it? It's our love. It, it, it's, it's, it's unity. It's, it's showing people that we love them. Our problem is we've made our mission all about being right. And we were never called to be right. But we were called to be loving. That's our calling. To be loving. We've forgotten that those people that we look at and we, they make us mad and angry and we want to respond to them. We've forgotten that they, their sin is just like our sin and our sin is just like their sin. It's like we've forgotten that it was Jesus that found them just like he found us. It's like we've forgotten that it was Jesus who healed them just like he healed us. He called them out of the grave just like he calls us out of the grave. He shows real love to them just like he shows us real love. He washed away their sins just like he would wash away our sins. It's, it's like we've forgotten. We've gotten our eyes on the wrong enemy. 
and we've forgotten the right mission. What would happen? If we were to do what Jesus prayed and that we were to begin to experience perfect unity, what would it be like? I wrote down some things. If we were, as the church of Jesus Christ, to begin to experience unity, let me tell you what would happen. Husbands and wives would stop fighting each other. And they'd start fighting for each other. If we begin to experience perfect unity, fathers and mothers would return home. Families would be strengthened. And kids, kids would have hope. If the church were to unify. If we were to come together, parents would declare that their children will serve and follow Jesus Christ. They would live every day to nurture them, to equip them, and to love them with the love of Christ if we were just unified. Families would come back together. Brothers and sisters who hadn't spoken in years would embrace themselves. Fathers would speak to their sons again. Mothers would speak to their daughters again. If we would unify, our schedules would change. Like all of a sudden, we would all become morning people. We, we would be just like the psalmist who wrote, I rise before dawn and I cry for help because I, my, my, all my hope is in your word, Lord. Like we would pray and we would read the Bible if we were unified. A grocery a trip to the grocery store would be different. Like it would be an opportunity to show somebody the love of Christ. The way we treat other people would change. Like we would actually believe the best about them instead of assuming the worst. The rumor mill would stop and the prayers would start. Families wouldn't hide their problems. They wouldn't try to cover them up, but they would invoke the prayers of God's people because they know that where prayer is focused, power falls. That is what would happen when we come together and we're unified. Like it just changes everything. It changes church. It changes church. Like everything about church changes. There won't be a seat open beside you when we become unified because the world wants this. The world wants to see unity. They, they want us to, to get rid of this division. They want that kind of love. You would, you would move from just simply being a spectator to becoming a participant. If we just experienced perfect unity, giving would change. Like we... We wouldn't ask, oh, how, how, how much do I have to give? No, we would ask, how much can I give? Every orphan, every foster child would have a forever family when the church becomes unified. Every surrounding county would not just hear about the name of Jesus, but they would see Jesus in us. It would change the world, y'all. There's a war going on out there. We are at war, but we're not at war with each other. We're not at war with people on the left. We're not at war with people on the right. This is a war between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of darkness. That is the war we're in. 
And so we gotta quit fighting the wrong enemy. And we gotta pursue the right mission. Church, you were never called to be right, but you're always called to be loving. That is how they're gonna see Jesus by our love. We bow your heads. Close your eyes. Christians, I want to talk to you just for a moment. As you just put yourself in a posture of prayer, will you do that? Just a posture of prayer. Have you made someone else in your life the enemy? It's a simple question. Have you had your eyes on the wrong enemy? Let me, let me tell you something. Maybe you've been targeting the wrong one. With God's help, with God's help, you can fight that. Why don't you right now just begin to identify in your own life, God, these are the... These are the people, these are the things that I've made the enemy. Go ahead, confess them to him. And just just tell him right now, God, I want to get back on mission of loving people. Go ahead, Christians, you, you do that. Maybe you're here today or you're watching on the other side of a screen and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. I, I want to I go back to a, a portion of Scripture that Jesus prayed. He prayed this to God the Father. He, he said, I, I pray, God, that they would know that you love them as much as you love me. Think about that one for just a moment. God loves you as much as he loves his own son. Do, do, can you feel the weight of that kind of love? That's how much he loved you. He loved you so much that he gave his son Jesus to pay the penalty of your sin and my sin on the cross. He loved you that much. He died for you so that you could have a relationship with him, so that you could have your sins washed away, so that you could be changed forever. So my question is, has there ever been a time in your life when you have surrendered your life to Jesus Christ? When you've said, I'm yours. Listen, stop fighting. You don't have the strength to fight. You need Jesus. There is an enemy that is waging war against you and he wants to take you down. He wants to kill you, steal your soul. And the only salvation you have is Jesus. So surrender your life to him right now. If that's your prayer, why don't you just call out on him right now. Pray this prayer. Just say, Jesus, I believe that you are the risen son of God. Jesus, please forgive me of my sins. Go ahead, ask him. I promise you, He hears you. Jesus, please forgive me of my sins. I'm inviting you to come into my life right now. Go ahead, invite Him in. And tell Him this, Jesus, I'm giving you my life today. I'm all yours. I'm surrendering my life to you. Listen, if that was your prayer, Jesus Christ just saved you. He just saved you. Like, isn't that amazing? Your sins are forgiven. You have just encountered grace unlike any other thing in the world. If that was your prayer, wherever you are, I want to ask you, will you just raise your hand wherever you are right now, all over this auditorium? Would you raise your hand right now? And by you raising your hand, you're saying, Pastor, I just prayed that prayer. I just gave my life to Jesus Christ. Go ahead, raise it up, raise it up. Hands are going up right now. Raise them high. Raise them high. Let me see you. Raise them high. Thank you so much. God bless you. Right over here. God bless you. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you so much right there. Who else? Go ahead. Raise them up. Raise them up. Let me see you. Thank you so much. God bless you. Thank you. Those of you that are on watching on the other side of a screen, you can raise your hand. 
If you're an online church, just click the little hand raise emoji. Follow the links that are in the chat sections, okay? You gotta tell somebody. Saying yes to Jesus is the best thing you could ever do. It's like the first step in fighting this war on your soul. Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus Christ. Thank you that today people have said yes to you. Father, I pray that we, as the church of Jesus Christ, could become the answer to his prayer. May we become unified. May we not fight the wrong enemy. May we begin to, to live out and to live for the right mission of loving people to you, Jesus. I pray that they would see you in us and by them seeing you in us and by us coming together and being unified, we're gonna change the world. God, we love you, we praise you. And all of God's people said a big amen. Will you give him a hand?